country and also we're going to look at the short summary that I asked you to read of the how the world's most improved school systems keep getting better. Right? Yes? I'm not speaking Greek, right? Yeah, you all still to warm up. I said the link I said the wrong link. I said the link to the entire article, the entire document. And Jason who's always quick to patch me at stuff like that emailed me right away and then I tried to fix it. So thank you, Jason. Vanessa, how are you? I can't hear you. Speak louder. You look good. Well, we're happy to see you. All right, before we go into the, um, into the case studies, I want us to talk a little bit about the report's findings, just to give you a little bit of background. Um, this report was done, they did, uh, they did a report in 2007, which was the precursor to this, which was called How the World's Best Performing School Systems Come Out on Top. And the best performing school system in the world, you would think, would be where? Um, right. Finland and Singapore were the top two that they looked at, um, that, that came out on top. And partly the reasons that they cited for that had to do with the importance placed on education nationally, that teaching is considered to be a well-respected, highly regarded, well-remunerated position, uh, occupation in those two countries, that there's time built in for team teaching, meaning the teachers have time to confer with each other and um, decide on strategies for teaching together. They also, all of them tend to have master's degrees, so they are um, more highly trained than other country systems. They also have something in, in Singapore, for example, where the teacher also has an assistant who helps with the scheduling and the grading and sort of the attendance taking and sort of the little details that are more um, managerial in the class, which frees the teacher up to do the teaching, right? So those were some of the key points that they made. Another key point in that report that I can recall, that's not the report I asked you to read today, but the first report, is that they, they mentioned in that report how critical grade one is, and that if you have a solid teacher at grade one, the chances of you continuing to, to progress well, to progress solidly, are much higher than if you had a weak teacher at grade one. Why grade one? Grade one because that's when most school systems begin to have fully free or fully paid um, education, right? That's interesting because in our country, we haven't placed great emphasis on grade one. I don't know in St. Lucia or in Bermuda, Dominica, do you place a lot of emphasis on grade one? Let's start one by one, St. Lucia. Grade one emphasized as a key grade in your country? Did you hear the question? So grade two, not not grade. Who's speaking? Saint Luke Show. Yeah, we can't hear. I think that I think there's more emphasis on grade two because there's a there's a the first national examination, a minimum standard exam, and I think they pay more attention to grade two. In, including the teacher who they put in grade two, they make sure they have the really good teachers. The teachers they consider, the principal considers to be really good, they put them in grade two, grade two, grade four, and grade six. Well, that's interesting. Those are when you have national exams in grade two, grade four, and grade six. 
Right. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Let's have Dominica. It's grade one. Pay extra attention to. No, we are also grade two. We start with our grade two assessments. Okay. All right. And uh, Bermuda. Anybody knows? Couldn't hear you, Jason. You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. Okay, we can hear that. Thank you. We also have a we also have a test given in grade two and grade four and grade six, but I wouldn't say that we place great emphasis on putting the strongest teachers in grade two or grade four. Jamaicans. Grade six. Grade six is given a lot of attention because that's the transition year from primary to secondary, um, but grade one is not particularly overemphasized by us. But recently, we have been looking at placing, mandating, and using it as a strategy, the placement of an early childhood trained teacher in grade one as best as possible. Because there was a, a small sample qualitative study done where they looked at the achievement over a few years of children in grades one, two, three, and four, boys and girls, they disaggregated by gender in similar similar type public schools. It was a control study, which means that one set of the schools had an intervention and the other set of the schools did not, right? That's what a control study does. So it turned out that the, the, the schools that had the early childhood trained teacher in grade one, the children performed a lot better, both the boys and the girls, even, almost evenly better. Why? Because grade one is still an early childhood classroom, it's age six. And the early childhood trained teacher was using more interactive, more team-based, more game-based methodology in teaching, as opposed to sort of individualized desks and so on that you see happening as the children move up in the system, grade three, grade four, grade five, grade six. That's the only real emphasis that we have placed on grade one. But in this first 2007 McKinsey report, the report begins with a talk uh, with, with a, a section that talks a lot about the importance of getting grade one right, starting them right. Now, in countries like Finland, they don't start school until, they don't start, start formal school until they're six. So they stay at home. I've, I've told you this before, right? Yeah. So they stay at home for various reasons, and no other country can really necessarily, many countries can't copy that. But they went back, McKinsey, and they looked again and looked at which school systems were improving and were continuing to improve. And so they looked at countries in different regions of the world, the US, um, Armenia, the, the East, Hong Kong, Africa, Ghana, England, Jordan, Latvia, Lithuania, um, Singapore, South Korea, etc. Right? So I'm not going to go over each of the eight points myself. I'm going to ask for some of you to help me do that so that you all are participating. Got that? So first of all, I need to see a raise of hands if any of you read it. So you have to be telling me the truth or if you have it in front of you. Bermuda, Jason, were you able to access this document? Yes. Thank you. Dominica, were you able to access the document? No. St. Lucia, were you able to access the document? No, we didn't. See now, that's curious to me. Why is that? When I emailed it to you, if you couldn't access it, why wouldn't you email me back and say, sorry, we can't find it, the link doesn't work, like Jason always does? Yes, Jason always does. No, only Jason. Jason always does that. And I'm grateful for Jason doing that, because then Jason points out to me that I sent you the huge document not realizing my mistake, because when I make mistakes, we all make mistakes. And so I try to fix it. All right, that, then that strategy won't work. So then I'm, you're going to have to then listen to me go through the eight points. One question I asked. Yeah, but if you didn't read it, it's kind of difficult. So I'll just go through it. That's fine. Um, so the first point that they make is that systems can make gains from wherever they start, meaning that if you, if you Pick an, uh, an area to focus on, and you put concerted effort into it, that you can make gains against where you started. You might not be making gains in relation to other countries, but in relation to where you started, that's what the point is. All right, so, and then they give examples of particular countries where they did 
did particularly well. Latvia is one where, and that's not really important to me. What I want you to take away from that point is that you have to create benchmarks and targets that are relevant to your school setting and then try to achieve them in your context. It's, type, it's a type of thing, yeah, that's another type of assessment. But basically you have to have a principal who's committed, you have to have teachers on board, you have to have a shared vision. These are things that I've been saying a lot. If you have that, then you have motivated teachers, you have motivated students, you have high teacher expectation, and then the school starts to improve. You have a question? Loudly, so they are saying that that's what struck me about the point, but the leadership. Yes. And how that um, that the leadership is such a key um, component of any kind of progress. Um, yes, one of the other points that they make is that you need to have continuity of leadership. So you might have a strong leader for two years, and if that leader leaves, then you, you run the risk of moving backwards instead of continuing to move forward. So they were saying that in some cases, I think that was the last, yeah, the last point made. Um, that in some countries, you know, the tenure of different superintendents might only be two or three years, and really it should be longer based on what they're finding out. Because it takes a while to get the system in place, and then once it is in place, you have to have the person who crafted the system, who's invested in the system, stay for a while in order to get it on a really strong track. So that, yes, it does emphasize leadership. Another key point that they make is the emphasis on Process, meaning, I don't know if you can see this, but I'll type this up and send it. So I'm writing the word leadership, that's one point, and continuity. I'm not using the computer today, I'm going old school, you can't see it, but I'll type it to you later. So leadership, and then the second one was process, right? You need to focus on process, meaning, that they found that a lot of reforms tend to look at changing the content of what is being delivered, as well as the methodology of the delivery. And that you need to focus on one or the other, and that of the two, the methodology of the delivery is the more important one. So, it isn't that we're going to get positive results by necessarily creating new types of schools, building new institutions, changing the resources, or changing the processes, but by that you should change the processes. You should look at what you're doing and see what's working and emphasize that. Another, another finding was that systems that were moving from fair performance to good performance, this was interesting to me. So they disaggregated their findings from, from school systems that were moving from fair to good and, uh, what did they call it? Good to great. So fair to good, good to great. The fair to good systems used a lot, put a lot of emphasis on data, gathering data and data driven decisions. Because data is important, right? But the ones that were moving from good to great focused on shaping their teaching. Again, so you had data-driven decisions and teacher pedagogy and practice. Go back to process. So it does go back to process, yes. But remember, the ones that are good to great probably already have more data. So that's why they're not emphasizing data collection, because they probably have that data. They're using it in form practice. And they're using it now to inform key component, which is the teacher. You know people say a good teacher can teach anywhere in any environment? Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a lot of fancy resources or gimmicks or costumes or whatever. If you're a good teacher, if you know your subject, if you're passionate about your subject, and if you care about your students, you can teach while sitting under a mango tree. Okay. Um, the next thing they said was that some systems, the best mix of Reform is a mixture of mandating and persuading, meaning the central government has to sometimes decide to mandate change. You can't wait and say, we all want you, we're trying to get buy-in, we're trying to get buy-in. Sometimes you have to take 
centrally, centrally take executive decisions and you have to mandate them. But you have to find a fine balance between the persuasion and the mandate. Then they listed six interventions which they said occur in all of these systems. Right? Now I'm running out of space. I was writing too big. The six ones are, again, building the skills of the teachers. That's one. Two was student assessment, increasing student assessment, varying the modes of assessment and increasing that data gathering, improving the data systems. Or um, policies and laws that will help in the mandating. Five, um, revising curriculum. And the sixth one is remuneration and reward for the teachers and the principals. So that's an interesting one because that's talking about performance-based teaching, performance-based pay, performance-based acknowledgement. And they said that in all the systems that were improving, these were happening to different degrees, that there were commonalities across all of them. So when I sit back and I think about what we do in Jamaica, we had a process um, in early 2000, I think it was, 2002, thereabouts, where we had a, a, a group of people came together and they produced a document called um, led to the creation of a transformation unit within the Ministry of Education. It was called the Task Force Task Force for Education Reform. And there were two, two key documents that emerged out of that. This was mandated by Parliament and then the committee met over multiple sittings and they created a large document which was called the Task Force Report of 2002. And then they did a secondary one which looked only at the early childhood system. Because when they did the first one, they realized that they hadn't spent any time looking at early childhood and that early childhood would warrant its own. So out of the task force report on early childhood came the creation of the Early Childhood Commission, which looks at overseeing the some 2,600 early childhood institutions we have, which are both public and private, which has developed standards for them, which has developed teacher training programs for them, which has developed inspection methodology for the schools to gather data. Um, and, and, and there's a whole host of health-related activities that they also do because the Early Childhood Commission is an example of joined-up government, which is something our politicians like to say a lot. But it is, it's a multi-sectoral committee with representations from all the government agencies, government ministries that deal with, that speak to children. So in our case, health, education, labor and social security, the planning institute, that's you, um, the Ministry of, um, no, you wouldn't be because it's early childhood, right. Um, social welfare, all of those people sit on the board and oversee the work of the Early Childhood Commission. And in fact, that commission is very well regarded internationally. So other countries now come to us to ask us how we did it and can we give them advice on how we set up this Early Childhood Commission and the oversight mechanism. Of course, there's an act that brought it into law. In terms of the task force reform for primary and secondary, there was a transformation unit created in the ministry. And among the activities of that unit have been a focus on literacy and numeracy, have been a focus on stronger teacher preparation through the creation of a teaching council, which is in, in time intended, once the law is passed, to uh, regularize and uh, professionalize the teaching profession. It will accredit teachers and require teachers to take additional courses to maintain their license. It will be a teacher licensing body. Then you have the national, what's the other one called? There's a leadership college for principals. So in Jamaica, the system has always been that you become a principal by being a teacher for many years and then principal right. retires and then you become the vice principal and then you become appointed to be the principal. But the, the leadership college is intending to change that by giving principals courses on Small leadership, leadership, leadership management. school management, issues significant to the Jamaican school system and contexts like violence, counseling, security of the perimeter of the, of the school, um, parent-teacher relationships, etc. Yes, they had a, a 
quote unquote testimonial on one day. No, 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 no. They were yes, like testimonial yes. on quote, I was quote unquote that. testimonial on as a cover story of the media yeah. this week. I don't remember if it was Monday or Tuesday, where a school in St. Louis is like a primary school. Yes. Can, sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you hear Sonia? Please raise your hand if you can hear her. Okay, St. Lucia can hear you. Bermuda can hear you. Dominica, you can hear Sonia? Okay. Keep going. Louder. Right. I was saying that based on what you're saying about the National College for Leadership, there was a quote unquote testimonial on the as the cover story on the dean of the national paper here this week where the minister of education was actually showcasing one of the success stories out of the national um, leadership college where a primary school principal in St. Elizabeth was able to achieve over 70% improvement in the school performance. In the school performance on a, on a literacy, I think it was right. So actually, um, it did it did do, the story did say that. But if you read the story, mm -hmm. you'll write, you'll read that in last year in her grade four class, grade four they take a national exam, literacy and numeracy. She had four students a day. Four out of eighteen students passed the exam. This year, seven or eight mm -hmm. out of eighteen passed. Mm -hmm. So it's not yeah because all of reporters report very. It have to be sensational. Yeah. So so they improved. Seventy five percent is a bit uh, sketchy, but they did improve. They went from four to I think a, a larger percentage, but seventy five percent only. Correct. And how did she do that? Well, she said that she involved the parents. She incentivized the teachers. She incentivized the students. She but remember she's working with small numbers. Okay, she's working with 18 students, right? But anyway, it's still encouraging, right? And the teacher and the principal deserves commendation for focusing on improving her students' literacy skills. And when you say that, my mind is going into another area now. We'll talk about system leadership because somebody like her could be using Saint Elizabeth as the standard to help the other teachers in the primary system to kind of model. Kind of yeah, fun. one of the things that we don't do well in Jamaica, maybe you do well in other countries, is that first of all, we don't gather system wide data like this where we can be sharing across right. the system to determine what's happening. We have the data, but we're not necessarily doing all the analyses that we need to do or we could do to look at which parishes we know which parishes are performing worse than others. We know which parishes have strong performances. We know which schools have consistently strong performance in the grade four and the grade six and the grade but we're not, then we don't go to those teachers and those principals and say, okay, let us correlate now your best practices. Okay, right. And let us share them with the system. Let us include them in teacher training programs. Mm -hmm. Right? We haven't done that. No. So actually, I wanted, I tried to invite a colleague who has one of those schools in East Kingston. I mentioned you to her. I mentioned her to you before. She's the principal, and over the her time in, in, in this school, which is quite a large school, I mean, it's a, it's a full primary school with, you know, four grade ones, four grade twos, four grade threes. She has been, hi Courtney, she has been focusing on improving her literacy and numeracy, So and she lobbies for her school. So her school needs a computer lab, so she will, she will beg for the computer lab. She will go out and she will make relationships with banks and so on and get them to visit the school, invite them to come for Read Across Jamaica Day, visit the school, invite them to come for Labor Day. She, and she herself is becoming more of a national figure because she's one of the judges on Schools Challenge Quiz. And she's a former principal of the year. So she leverages that to get support into her school. So now last year she got a computer lab. She uses a computer lab not only for her students but for their parents. So she has the school stays open later. She has portfolio assessments done on all her children, all her students that the parents pay for. This is a public school, this is not a wealthy school. So that when the children leave at grade six, they take this portfolio with them. She goes and visits each house door to door. She's the principal and she asks the teachers to do the same thing and the vice principal so that everybody knows everybody else. She has field trips for her parents as well as the students. She has, um, she will, if she needs to repaint the school, she will invite somebody to come Sorry. and speak to the <laughs> yeah, school. I told you, it's the same one, mm -hmm. but she couldn't come today. She, she can't come today or next week. She just can't come on Wednesdays, which is a shame because she's very dynamic. 
and, and it would have been good for you to meet her. So instead of, she has a vision for her school and she has a vision for her students. And she communicates that vision to her teachers. So when you walk onto her school ground, you know somebody's in charge, it's clean, it's well signed, it's, it's painted, it's not peeling off. There's plants, there are, I mean, it's a concrete school, but there are plants and trees where there can be. Um, and this is a principle that you see walking around her school. This is not a principle that you see sitting in her, in her office all day long. She walks around her school and she observes her teachers. She talks to the teachers after she watches them teach. So she, she shows an interest and in return, the teachers are interested. Mm -hmm. Right? So she's managing her school, which is for all intents and purposes, a small to medium sized business. Mm. And you think of the number of people she's serving in the community. Mm. But those, those traits, right? Some people just have them naturally. naturally right? Right? She's one of those that have them naturally. But those traits are, are, are traits that can be developed. encouraged and developed and taught. You know, if you're told these are some strategies you can try. And, and it works for your colleagues in a similar location that you might try. It. Um, so your point is taken, Sonia, that there are these pockets of excellence, but we are not we are not good at collating that information, and the media is not good at reporting that. The media would prefer the media would prefer to report all failing schools and so on. So, for example, the media also reported today that we have a transition program in our school system where if you can't pass the grade four, you can't take the grade six test, which means you can't get into high school in the traditional way. I'm sure I've told you this before. So we've created a, a, a transition sort of holding program, which is called ASEP, Alternative Secondary Transition Education Program, I guess, ASEP. And what that's intended to do is to, is to take the secondary school curriculum, the grade seven, the grade eight, or what we call first form and second form, and summarize it and, and find the main points and teach it to the students who are then sent to either um, a campus of a high school into a certain block or a campus of a primary school into a certain block because now they're 12, 13 years old. They don't stay in grade six because we don't have space for them to repeat grade six. So they go and they have their own teachers. There's attempts to engage their parents. There's attempts to make the curriculum more game-based more interactive because the overwhelming majority of these children in our case are boys every year but what this report today said was that the system is failing the a-step program is failing but if you that's the headline but if you read the story what you hear is there's this, the program as conceptualized was meant to stop the conveying conveyor belt system of children going through our education through our grades and getting into secondary school unable to read or write effectively for their age. So when they get to secondary school, the high schools were telling the, the ministry and the, the, the public at large, we can't live with these children. They can't read, they can't write for their age. We are not taught to be remedial teachers. We need to teach our curriculum. We have students who are here ready to access the curriculum, but we can't teach them because we have to be stopped trying to help other students who might have developmental challenges, who might have special needs, who might have traumatic issues at home that impede their learning, and we can't, we're not equipped to deal with that. So this conveyor belt system had to stop, and this was one attempt to stop it, to create this national test. If you don't pass it, you get four more chances with support. If you don't pass it after all of that, you go into this A-step system, you still get the curriculum for your age, but it's taught differently. The materials are slightly different. And then at grade nine, you take a grade nine, a grade nine assessment and you get fused back into the existing system. What this report was saying was that ASTEP is failing because the percentage of the students every year that are passing the grade nine and getting back into the original system is very low out of the total number of students. But it also went on to say that a lot of students are just not showing up for the exam. They're just not showing up. They're not showing up for the exam. They may not be showing up for their classes. And so what the Ministry of Education is saying that they had not imagined when they crafted the program that they would need social workers and a more holistic intervention support network for these families. And so what they're trying to do now is they've employed social workers and they're trying to see what kind of effect that will have in order to get the students there. If they're not coming to the program, then they can't pass the test. 
So the program is not necessarily failing, but it's a work in progress because otherwise the question is what happens to these students? We go back to the system we had before where they just go into high school and they float along and they're not learning anything and then they drop out at grade nine. So it's a work in progress, but obviously the headline is much better to say, it's much more, more people are going to read it if it says failing than work in progress. Right. So you have to, th that takeaway is that you need to read, you need to read the articles and see what's actually being said, even though sometimes what's reported is not even near to what the reality is in our case. But back to the whole transformation project that we have been undertaking, it's an attempt to take a lot of these lessons that have come internationally and apply it to a Jamaican context. What we're not doing as good a job on is sort of the reporting on it, assessing it as it's going on and reporting on it. I'm told that in Parliament last week there was a document tabled on the transformation, which I'm trying to get a copy of. So if I can get that before next week, I can, I can read it and share some of the main points because the transformation unit within the ministry now is coming to its end. They're going to disband it because the salaries of the staff, etc., run its course, so they're going to disband it. But the programs are supposed to now be in place. The National College on Education Leadership, that's the principal training, the teacher, the Jamaica Teaching Council, that's the teacher licensing, the Early Childhood Commission, the literacy and numeracy specialists that work as coaches in groups of schools, the national inspection, um, unit, NEI, National Education Inspectorate, which inspects schools. So they haven't finished inspecting all of our schools yet, but they are gathering more and more and more data. The data is not positive, overwhelmingly positive, but at least we're getting the data. So we're in the fair to good position in relation to this. We're still gathering data. But meanwhile, we do have these pockets of excellence, which I'm sure every country has, but is every country doing what we can to gather that information, embed it in teacher training programs, and embed it across the system in service. We are not. I don't know if in any of this makes sense to you in the other countries, if any of this sounds familiar as to what's going on in your countries. Dominica, St. Lucia. Dominica, how about you? Um, we have the same, we have um, universal secondary education. So what that lends itself to is that you have a large number of um, students going into the first form or degree seven equivalent I, I don't know. And um, many of them are not prepared. So so we um, we divide the special classes, special schools, but uh, it's the same problem. Also anything that's working? Well, um, uh, when, they, uh, when they come to the secondary schools, um, but my school, we have a system where they are in a separate um, class. We call it the remedial class. So the students would stay in that class for <laughs> as long as they, they they are, they are able to come into the mainstream, so to speak. Sorry, go ahead. And, and, and so, um, these students, they do, the work that they do is much different than what the ordinary children do. You know, it's a watered down curriculum for them, so to speak. So one of the issues... And sometimes... Sorry, I was going to say... Yeah, one you want to ask it if it's working? Well, um, um, if it's working, it's working, it's working slowly because sometimes some of these students, when they are able, you know, they're tested, uh, especially with the maths and the English, and then when when we begin to see results, positive results, you know, see improvements, then these students are shifting from the remedial classes into the mainstream. And some of them, they do well eventually. Right. So in our case, what we also might be suffering from is that there's some sort of stigma attached to the program. And so the students are not showing up because of the stigma attached to it. I don't know, but that's something that we have to 
be assessing. So I'm sure in your case, if they're in the same school and the children have to be in that class, the other children know um, why they're there. And this is adolescence, so this is a particularly pivotal time now for how children think of each other and interact with each other, meaning this is the time when children start to pay more attention to what their parents think of them than perhaps their parents. Right? So yes, that's, that's very true. That's very true because their self-esteem, you know, really drop. And sometimes they are ashamed of the they, they, they do not want the other children to see what the teacher is teaching or on, on the chalk bus. And sometimes all the children will be passing by and they will, they will, when they see the work that these students are doing, they will laugh at them. You know, they will tease them after, you know, when they see them on the ground and they really feel bad about it. You know, they feel, they feel more what the, the, the school may think about them than what, what the teacher thinks about them. That's so that's very true. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's hear from Sonia and then we'll go to um, another country. Well, Miss, I'm, I'm not very, very okay with all the elements of the school system. Now, when you mention a step, when you mention a step, I can identify it, but they're also doing a similar thing with CAP, career advancement programs, where the students who have finished high school but are not able to move on for whatever reason. They'll have them in a career program in the high school yeah. but that has failed because of the same um, put down. The students feel like they're less of a, per of a person and so they have reformed that and they have taken cap out of high school and placed them in the college. Because yeah. we have 75 CAP students. So we are the cap side serving the region in which I am. Okay, so Sonia is talking about a, another age group, which is another reform that came from Jamaica looking at our, our system and trying to learn from what other countries have done, but knowing what our problems are. So we have a problem of transitioning kids from grade 6 into grade 7. That's one of our problems. We have another problem of not identifying our kids early enough for early screening and referral for, for support, which we're addressing at the early childhood level. That's a longer term scenario because we have to train people to be occupational therapists and audiologists and speech pathologists and basic general developmental therapists who are not as highly trained as the three I just named to treat with children who might have specific developmental delays. We just don't have enough on the island. So there's a training program going on here at UWE to do that so that when we, when we start screening on a broad level children at age four, we can refer them but not referring everybody into Kingston because they cannot come to Kingston from the West. It's very hard or even two hours away. So there's that. So in the, in 10 years from now, you shouldn't have as many children who fail the grade four, right? But in the meantime, we have that problem. So we have A step. Then we have, we have students who we didn't get at grade four who are already in secondary school, not reading and writing at their age level. So they can't pass the CXC. They can't get ones, twos, or threes. Okay, so they're That's not true. getting. Very good. They're not That's getting. True, they're not getting their accreditation. So what happens to them when they finish fifth form? What happens to them? So a program was created to try and bridge them, bridge them into sixth form or into community college or into the world of work through vocational training. So Jamaica has a national training institute called Heart which is an acronym for human something, I don't know. But it's called HEART, I don't remember the acronyms, but it's that one. And it's all over the island, and they have different levels within HEART. It's a huge institution. And what CAP, which is called the Career Advancement Program, intended to do was to catch these students before they went out onto the street and they had nothing to do, and put them into a program where they could access HEART training on their school grounds or easily access level one, and then move to level two, but they still would have to take math and English again at CSEC. They have to pass math and English, human employment and resource training, right? Um, and so with the best of intentions, that program was crafted, as with ASEP, the best of intentions. But when you have an idea and then you put it into practice, what you have to do is learn from how it actually works in reality and then reconfigure it based on the strengths and the weaknesses. 
And so that's what you're saying now. So it's taking away the stigma by putting them, instead of placing them still in their high schools, so they, top students originally would come to school when school ended. So normal school would be happening from 8 to 2 or whatever time, and CAP students would come from 2 to 5 or 2 to 6 or 4 to whatever it was. Yeah, but the plans would stay open longer, so you would be reutilizing the same spaces because you couldn't build new schools. There's no money to build new schools. So that was the idea. But now Sonia is sharing that it has evolved into sending them instead of to the high school campus, to the community college campus. Of community colleges and even I think the one in Mandeville family. Right, so, so the aligned the institutions. Aligned, not NC. But they put them there because, okay, so when they're there, they have an ID, they carry right. the name of the institution. Right. So that no one in their sense. community right. would say, okay, you're not going to the college of any project that is going to come but no, that makes perfect sense. And so what that is, I wouldn't say that the CAP program is failing. The intent is still there. The idea is still good. But the, the packaging of it has changed change. to remove yeah. the stigma that caused students to drop out of the program. So, so the, the reform of any system has to take place at multiple levels. That's one of the lessons. It can't just take place at, at grade four. right? And what works in one country isn't going to necessarily work in another country. But because we can share information now um, easily, countries are learning much faster what's happening in countries of similar sizes, right? Even if their cultural backgrounds are different, we can get that data and we can use it. So Jamaica used a lot of references in our transformation program to what was going on in England at the time. I don't know why we used England, but that's what we did. We just we did. Maybe because of the link with the being a former colony, I don't know, or because our system itself is embedded in a very English format with the tests and so on. Tests at key stages, that's what we do. So there were, there were, there were quite already existing similarities between our system and the British system as opposed to our system and the US system. So we looked to what England was doing and what was working in England to help inform what we wanted to do. And it's an ongoing process and it's not going to work overnight, it's going to take years, decades. So transformation is not something that you can say, or ed reform is not something that you can say is going to work right away. In contrast to the McKinsey report, there was an article I read about Finland recently. Finland, as I told you, is very highly regarded. And the thing about Finland is that there's a new book, which I'll share the, the um, citation with you uh, later on in the week or tomorrow. And it's, like, it's called Lessons from Finland by a Finnish educator. And basically, she goes, through, um, she goes through all the different elements that education reform movements have used, many of which I've listed up here and we've touched on this, this afternoon. But she says they're very, very different from what they do in Finland. So what do they do in Finland? They, as I told you, she begins by talking about the fact that edu teaching is a highly regarded profession. So there's high levels of confidence in the teachers and the principals amongst themselves, from the students and the parents. So that's very important, she says. Then she says they, they are very, uh, very much interested in not necessarily pursuing only core subjects, but encouraging teachers and students to try new ideas and new approaches. So again, the process they're focusing on over perhaps the content. And the third point she makes, which I think would be very tricky for us to make in Jamaica, I can't speak to the other islands, but she says the purpose of teaching and learning in Finland is to pursue the happiness of learning. So learning for learning's sake, rather than um, learning to learn a particular subject to get a particular job. Right. And cultivating the development of the whole child, so there's a holistic element to the teaching. Now, I don't know if our general public would be very happy to hear that schools are teaching just or what? Or to pursue the happiness of learning is how it's translated, to pursue the happiness of learning. But she says the way to improve your school system is that teachers and leaders, meaning the principals, have to be well prepared and that they must have some level of autonomy in what they're, how they're teaching, right? 
uh, which would be a lot more difficult for, I know, for Jamaica. That would be very contentious. But it works in the Finnish context. It may not work here, but that's what that's what works for them. And so, I haven't read the book. I'm just telling you, it was an article I read, I read this week about this new book. There's a great emphasis on play. They value play very highly for young children. So in, in their grade, in their age six, in their first class, the children are doing a whole lot of playing inside and outside. In our, in our children's classrooms that are six, there's not a whole lot of playing going on. There is more playing going on now than say 10 years ago. There's more playing going on now than 10 years ago in our early childhood classrooms because the curriculum is play-based now. But not at grade, not at age six, which is when in our mind they start formal schooling. Right? So um, sorry, I didn't let Bermuda share. Does Bermuda, do you have anything you want to add to the conversation? Not necessarily Jason, just anybody from Bermuda. Um, okay, no? All right. Um, who am I just it kind of went off of the tangent there. Um, kind of hard to remember what the original question was about. It was something about the um, student. The original question I remember was something about the students being tested at a certain level more than they used. I don't know what the question was. Sorry, I forget the question. Yeah, but I moved on from that question. The original question was, what happens at grade one in your in your country? Okay, well, grade one is kind of, um, well, what I remember was a bit um, of but, a big deal, but not being analyzed. Right, and I think, I think you, had, you had shared that. What I was asking now was, is there anything that seems to be working well in Bermuda? Are there any reform methods that are taking place that you know of in your country that are working? Oh, um... I don't, I don't know about reforms, but I know that the, um, a lot of the teachers in the government sectors are participating in workshops. Like They have so many workshops to participate in annually. I'm not sure what else they're doing. Uh, the I'm, not active. I'm not active, so. Are any of you active teachers now? I don't remember. Have you seen? Can you speak closer to the mic, Eva? I can't hear you. I really don't know about the general public. I think there are people for children who are very slow and all of that. I think people will be safe. But the people in the classroom try to help me. They may be like the people who are slow. Okay, so you're teaching the kind of what we just talked about in that, that type of scenario where they are taken from the classroom and put into a separate class and there might be some stigma right. involved in that. And that might be a methodology that Bermuda is using. Okay. There's no one where stigma actually because many students want to come with that. But they come and say, oh, I'm slow in math, I'm slow in this, I want to come with that class, but they really need that class of and at the same time, it's not geared for the students. Right. Right, you're targeting the most needy students. Right. Okay. All right. And in, the private, in the private school that I went to, uh, they did kind of segregate each um, class with the mathematics and English. So, like, if you were a little bit behind and you went into the, um, I want to say, the, what's the word, the lower, um, that's easier, um, what do you call it? Yeah, you, you just read like shorter stories, shorter sentences, and um, they just help you to build your comprehension um, at a slower rate compared to the rest of your classmates, which are um, yes. selling with. So it's a trap. It's a trap system. Yeah. Which, which is easier to organize and perhaps easier to teach in? Right? Because if you're teaching a group of students that are all at the same level, you can move them along at the same pace as opposed to having to teach in an inclusive setting where you have different levels, different learning styles, and different paces. 
So some systems prefer some systems prefer to work that way. It, it, it prevents frustration on, on in many level on many levels like the smarter students and the less um, achieved students uh, so that they can you know get what they need out of the best I mean, the teachers. Yeah, that's one argument for it. There are other arguments against it which we have I think raised in the class before um, in other on other sessions. But I want to also hear from um, Dominique of St. Lucia. Thank you, Bermuda. St. Lucia? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Are there, any, are there any reform mechanisms taking place in your country that you know of? Approaches to education reform or changes being made by your education system? No. In English and mass. And that's new? Are you ready? I'm sorry, I couldn't. All I heard was special no, it's, Yes, I said we have special teachers for English and math. In every class? Um, you mean for every grade, rather? No. No. But most of them get the attention. Okay. So, so there's a push to, to include uh, special ed resources. That's what you're saying. Yes, we have remedial classes in every form. Right. Okay, I'm not, thank you. I'm not only talking about remedial classes. I'm talking about system-wide e e efforts to transform the system, like I've been explaining that's been going on in Jamaica. Do you know of anything like that? No. Sorry, Dina, go ahead. And then Ashley, your hand is up. Okay, go ahead, Dina. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Good evening, everyone. I was asking, um, Miss, what do you think of those class ranking? Just, not just like, just for every class, like at the primary level or the secondary level, class ranking where you have like, um, First one, well, seven grade, you have seven, one, five, or five, three, lowest, low, low, lowest, low, 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 She's saying, she's asking, what do I think about the system of tracking that we have, where we have in high school, we have four grade, four grade uh, tens or anything, so it would be like, uh, what well, we call them fourth forms. It would be four, one, four, two, four, three, four, 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 five. And you and everybody knows that four one it has the stronger students for two and it goes down like that. She's asking, what do I think of that? Um, I don't think that that's particularly good because the students know that and then they make fun of each other. Um, so there's an element of self-esteem which is very important, both for motivation, which we already from what we read last week, I found out how important that is to students learning both on the part of the student and on the part of the teacher. So I don't I don't really like the tracking system, but I know that we do it. And we, we also, we encourage it because we then rank our students. Some schools will do the averages of the children from very young and tell you who comes first and yes. who comes second and who comes third. And they won't include art and music in, in the average. So they'll only include the core subjects. No, no, no. What they said already about some of um, like the tracking system that some students who may be in say the four four, yeah. you know, when they like based on their performance that it improves, they will be moved to say five one or five two. And so they're saying this is probably a method of even motivating the students or making that giving them a drive to wanting to be at the top. So 
Yeah, yeah. and the, and the thing is, is that in in the real world, you're not always going to be working with people that are working at the same pace or level that you are. And part of what you have to learn in life is how to get along with different types of learners and different types of people. So when you put people only on an accelerated course all the time, all the time, all the time, what is their norm is not the real norm in the world. And then that's a, that can come as a rude awakening when they go on to college where they're in a much bigger pool and now they're realizing that it's really not that way. Ashley, you wanted to say something? I wanted to ask you all this. Of the other forms of training that you spoke about, which one do you think is the most effective in your opinion? And, and or what do you think would be most so Ashley's question is, of the reforms in Jamaica that I kind of gave you a snapshot of, which ones do I think, which one do I think is the most, uh, has been the most effective? And, and, and if not, you want to have one up there, then what? Right. I, I think that the, um, the, the, what's happening at the early childhood level will bear fruit in maybe not in the next couple of years, but in maybe the next five to seven years. And I think that that's very important because it's for us, it's the, it's the groundwork, it's the bedrock of the whole system. So if we can identify children at age four who have developmental delays and we can give them the support that they need at four, by the time they reach six, some of them might be okay on a trajectory to, to function perfectly well in a standard classroom. Some of them may need extra help but rather than let them go through. So I think that that early screening and referral system is very important. I think the change to the early childhood curriculum to make it more play-based is very important. I think the standards that the schools now have to adhere to for public health and safety and teacher instruction are also important. I think the inspections that are taking place are very important because they give us data that we never had before. And that can help us to decide which schools are in need of which level intervention because we have um, minimal resources. So we, we can't be giving every school everything. So we have to make those decisions. So we have to use the data to drive decision making. So I think the, the early childhood national strategic plan, which is part of that, um, is, is critical. And that's why actually it's, it's looked at, it's well regarded internationally. So for example, when I wasn't here the week that you had it, Dr. Mungle and um, Hugh come, which I, I love Hugh, I'm sorry I missed him. Um, I was at a U UNICEF global meeting on inclusion in New York, and a number of UNICEF country education officers were there from all over the world, from the East, from Africa, from Russia, from, I mean, it was crazy how many people were there. And um, I would say at least five to five to seven of them came up to me and said, we're really interested in the work of the Early Childhood Commission, and we would like a lot more information on what, what Jamaica has done. It's called the Jamaica model, actually. So that we can learn and adapt it to what we're trying to do at early childhood in our countries. So I would say that, and I think second to that would be the focus on literacy. The key focus on so literacy. Yeah. I don't have to provide them with those statistics. They already know. I didn't go there to speak about early childhood. I went there to speak about what we're doing with special needs. That we pass the Disability Act, that we have um, we have special needs teachers, that we're doing this early screening, that we have a special needs policy, and various other things that we're doing in that area. But these people have read about Jamaica in, at the early childhood level in World Bank reports, in IDB reports, in um, UNICEF reports, in 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 journals like the Lancet, which is a well-regarded uh, early childhood health journal, academic journal. So they knew, and they asked, they want more information. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to give it to them, but I mean, Ashley's question is, what do I think has been the most groundbreaking? And I think that, and then secondarily, um, second to that would be the focus on literacy that has been renewed, that you have to have at grade four, you have to be functioning at least age appropriately. And if not, you need to get your help, whatever help and support you need to make that happen for the child. So that, and I don't mean, I'm not necessarily trying to refer to the US 
system, but that there's no child, as best as possible, we're not leaving any children behind. Right? You have a question, Sonia? Miss, there's another aspect of reform that I realize. There's another aspect of reform that I've noticed because everything we do is predicated on the British system. And there's another aspect that I've noticed, which is the turning schools into academies. We have borrowed from Britain that as well, because there are two academies in Jamaica now. One is operated by Curtis Cedar Grove Academy. And then there's another one in West London, I think. Yeah, then listen, I don't think that it's just the, the whole genesis behind. So Sonia's question is, we're borrowing from the British system. But I had mentioned the one in, in West London before, which is called Belmont. Belmont Academy. Belmont Academy. And part of that was that that was an example of a new school. This was also part of the transformation. Right. That new schools would be built. We have to raise money to build them. So far, we built maybe five or seven. I mean, we need many more than that. But in the building of these new schools, they would run under different schemes of management where the principals would be on contract, the teachers would be on contract, which means the unions would have less say in what goes on in the school and that the school would have a specific type of name so that the people in the community would see it as a different place and as a place to aspire to send their children to. Right. And that the, the grounds would be on the linking home and school would be a core element and that there were, there were lists of, um, I forget what they called them, there's a list of sort of 10 operating principles that these new schools were supposed to work with. They have a name, I can't remember the name, I'm sorry. Um, and they call it an academy. But it's just, it's a name, like Campion College is a college, it's called Campion College, but it's a high school, it's not a college. Oh. It's just a name. And what, they have, what has happened with that school in, in West Milan, which is in the, in the West, Obviously, but I mean, it's like four hours, what, three hours and a half from Kingston. Um, so it's a rural area. Is that it has become now a school of choice for the children in that area over time. The children, when they're putting down their, their choices at GSAT, when they're taking their grade six exam, they have to list their top three or four choices. I'm sure this happens in your countries too. That in that parish, that school is becoming one of the top two choices that children put down. Because there's a lot to be said for perception. Perception can drive how you how you look at something. And so by calling it an academy, you elevated the school. And then the school was meant to keep up with that image, meaning how it looks, the grounds, and there were these operating principles. I cannot remember the name. Because I was in those meetings when that place was being named. So I can tell you flat out that it was not about Following it, it was just what can we call it that it will give it some sort of a lift. Okay, I guess but my understanding sorry. of the academy sorry, is that um, scheme so, of management that's what those 10 things were called. It's a scheme of management. So, 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 College, Kingston College, um, Jamaica College. Yeah, I thought it wasn't going to be called Belmont High. You see okay. the difference between Belmont High and Belmont Academy? Because that's a private school. It's not a private school. It's a public school. It's a public school. But it's, it's just the name. What if I um college league table? Like in England, um, what I know is that when the schools excel and, and, and they do well, the teachers can actually well, the head teacher can actually run the school in their Based on how they want it, and it becomes an academy. I don't know about all of that. But I mean, the Belmont yeah, Academy, it's our academy. It's not, it's not a running it off. So, no. for example, when, not I, say, I, know it's a when I say academy, it's a what I understand is, for example, this school, this large school is in an area, serving 2,000. But you make an academy of it by having it focus on, say, arts. No, it's not like that. Or have it. It's not like that. 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 It's a school. It's a regular. Yeah. Courtney, you had a question. I want to move on. It's not really a question. It's 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 a
when we use the terminology in Jamaica about failing schools, because once we make that distinction at a particular school, even if the school's image and the <laughs> academic and performance increases over yes. time, the perception is that this school is a failing school, and then automatically students that would would be closing that geography to go to the school just because of the perception that they're going to a failing school. They they don't go there. And it's also said, and I have no scientific evidence to prove this, but it's also said that even students that were performing reasonably well in previous occasions, because they are placed into these schools that are deemed to be failing schools, their performances deteriorate after um, a period. Right, again, I don't have any data to prove that either that I have read, but, but perception, again, the concept of perception and expectations. and expectations by the teachers, by yourself, by your parents, how it can impact your performance. Now, that failing thing, I mean, again, the media has a very, in our country anyway, has a very powerful role to play. So uh, a person can make a comment that says, the schools are failing the students. It's not saying that the students are failures. It's saying that the schools are not serving the students as well as they need to be, and the schools need to be supportive, and so on. So it's not calling the students failures. You know. It's calling the system. The system is failing, right? But the way the media reports it now is that the students are failures, everybody's a failure, and that's all they focus on. And so your self-esteem, all of that, you have a negative perception, and it can impacts it impacts future performance. It would take a really strong leader now to go into that school and change the, the school's culture. Right? And, and just to underscore the point is that um, <laughs> I read an article <laughs> that leads to all the story of the book. Of the the book. The the book. The 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 can you turn off your mic? Thank you. Got it. Go ahead. I don't remember the name of the principal, but she. She went to, I think, um, Tarrant and she had done other schools. Right. There was a, a lovely article um, that we that we that I read. And and she went to some of these schools that were deemed to be written off or as it were. And because of her strong leadership and, and involvement in these schools, they have you know transformed. She is basically a transformational leader. So much to the point that they, they are now losing her as um, somewhat a mentor to other schools. Right, and they do that, but they do that on a very small scale. They do do that, and they have, in our system, they move principals like that, who have seemed to be doing very well in their school, whether it be primary or secondary, they move them, like another one was Mr. Parcho was moved from one from Tower to somewhere else. And then Mrs. Bolt oh, was doing right. right. So, so they, they are doing that. But I think we need to be doing more of that. More. So a strong leader, a strong principal, a strong leader, which came out as one of the main points in this every form. You might say, why am I having you read this? Because the course has been looking at the ways that education, an overview of the foundations of education. Well, one of the foundations is that education keeps changing. All right? One minute we're focusing on student outcomes, the next minute we're focusing on group work, the next minute we're focusing on um, you know, it, what, what countries are looking for, what's seen to be important, changes over time. And the way teachers are trained and the emphasis that's placed also changes. So in the 1980s, there was a lot of emphasis on multiple intelligences and cooperative learning. And now a lot more emphasis is being placed on teaching for social justice and the whole concept about the holistic development of the student and being creating citizens of the world, right, that are socially conscious. Um, so I wanted you to see sort of what, what are commonalities across different countries in terms of when you are organizing to spend millions of taxpayer dollars as well as loan money and grant funds to try and fix education because education is the cornerstone of everything. Every politician says that. We all know that. It's the gateway to opportunity. So if we have a strong education system, then we have a strong nation. Countries that succeed in the world have strong education systems. So many of the qualities that are listed as a strong leader 
and leadership being listed as one of the core principles of every form, successful every form, are the same qualities that were, I think, in many ways, described in that article by Grant and Zeigner that you read in the beginning of the, of the term, or the course, not really a term. Reflectiveness, wholeheartedness, what's the other one? Open-mindedness, open -mindedness, right? And so if you're a strong, if you have a vision for your school, you're going to inspire your teachers, you have to be those three things. Because obviously, wholeheartedness would also involve being passionate, right? There, 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 are, there are other adjectives we can use. Responsible, reflective, um, motivating. You can't do that kind of transformational work if you're not motivated. Neither in the classroom level or in the school as a school-wide level. And then you have to be a little bit more aware of the concept of teacher expectations, expectate your own expectations. Esther Tyson, when she was moved, she began to have high expectations for those teachers. And if they weren't going to meet her expectations, they knew that they were going to have they were going to have problems. It's the same thing that another principal did at Jamaica College, which is an old a uh, long time school that's been around for hundreds of years. And that's what he did. He went into that school and he said, this is what my vision is. This is the vision of the school board. This is what we want to see. You need to join us. If you can't make it, then we will bye bye. And that's what he did. He fired a number of teachers. He hired new teachers. And that school is on its way every year, improves its performance. Every year improves its athletic performances as well. It's not only academic. And now it's becoming, a, again, once again, a school of choice. It's an all-boys school, this one, for boys. Right? Has brought in new programs to the school, such as a partnership with, I can't remember with what, but students can choose to become pilots, and they can take CMI with the Caribbean Maritime Institute and with the Aeronautical Aviation Authority. So from fifth form, they can decide that they might be interested in that, and they can go that route. And then, yeah, yeah. All right, so so that's really why I've been mentioning why I wanted you to read this sort of overarching summary. And also, we, the issue of special needs was raised. No classroom teacher is going to be the same as a special needs teacher because you're not trained to be a special needs teacher. But in an article that Ashley again shared, Ashley sends me articles every week. She must read the New York Times on a particular day. And then she, she sends them to me. Hopefully you keep doing that, actually. Um, one of the things that this article that she sent me was about was about closing the poverty gap. So obviously poverty and low achievement are linked. Because you come from a poor home. I mean, I don't need to go over this again. You all know why poverty and the achievement gap are linked. This article said that one of the core things that teachers need to do it talks about a particular program in a few different states, is that teachers have had to realize that the children behave, have different behaviors, and that so whereas Thalia might respond very well to me saying to her, Thalia, I asked you to stop talking, stop talking now. She, that's not gonna stop Thalia from talking in future classes when I want her to speak. It's not going to affect Thalia's psyche. But if I say to Davy, I'm just making this up, this right. is not, if I say to David, David might not speak to me again for the rest of the term. So you have to have a sense of knowing your students, right? Yes. And also talking about how they would change the way that they question the students, as opposed to chastising them. They would question and speak in sort of a welcoming, sort of, we are all going to do this together using the pronoun we instead of I. Yeah, and also about how important communication is and the way that you're communicating. So she changed the children to, to work more in cooperative learning groups, but this particular program that's cited in this New York Times article also talks about how they provide coaches for the teachers and the schools to help the teachers to keep up this new strategy and to be reflective. They're causing them to reflect on their interactions, which if you remember, I mentioned to you in one of the first classes, how important that is for a teacher on an ongoing basis in whatever way you reflect. Whether it's written journals, computer journals, drawing pictures, talking to your friends, whatever it might be, reflecting on what John and James and Mary were doing today and why they were engaged or they weren't engaged. So that you can, each time you go into the classroom, you do better. 
And there was that book by Vivian Gus and Katie, which I mentioned, You Can't Say, You Can't Play, and there's a whole lot of books by her, which, which talk about the power of that type of reflection in improving your teaching. And this strategy in New York, which began after 9-11, speaks to the importance of communication and giving teachers extra support to improve their communication skills and their interaction skills. And another student, another teacher here talks about how before they were part of this coaching program, they would just call students out by name and sort of make fun of them or make an example of them, but that now they are um, they realize that for that age, for that age and developmental stage in middle school, it's a middle school teacher, middle school is like, what, uh, 12, 7, 8, 9, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13-ish, that the worst thing you can do is to embarrass them. So instead of calling their names and chastising them and criticizing them, that you try to say things like walking over to the student, maybe not calling out in front of all of this class, but saying, you ready to listen now? Quietly, and then you go off again back to the where we are teaching from. So, just how important communication is. And since the school has been um, participating in these programs, it's it's has shown that what the teachers do, how the teachers interact, they're serving as models for the students. So, how they speak to the students, the students take that in in the same way that students follow what what children follow what their parents do. They also follow how the teacher moves about the classroom, interacts, speaks, communicates, etc. So that was really the takeaway from that article to me. Ashley, did you get something else from it? No? Yeah, they, I mean, they have access to a lot more resources than we have. So, so we don't have that resource. I mean, we're not going to be able to test our students, how our students can find out on a trauma scale, what level of trauma they've been exposed to. But I mean, all of us can benefit from having a more open, more inclusive communication style, right? Whether we know the nitty gritty of the trauma that the students have experienced or not. Um, all right, we're okay. actually at 5.30, I can't believe that. So in the second half now, we're gonna do the presentation. So I'm gonna give you 10 minutes break, and then we'll start with Bermuda. I'm starting from the top of the alphabet. So Bermuda will go and then then Dominica, um, but actually you're leaving. So we'll do Bermuda. No, scratch that. Who else is leaving from here? Just Ashley. All right. So we'll start with Jamaica and then go to Bermuda. But I'm going to give you. I'm going to ask you, please, as you come in from your break, which is 10 minutes. It's 5:30 by my watch. You will get 10 minutes to talk with your colleagues about your presentation. Remember. Nobody else in any other country has read your case. So you have to explain the main characters. You have to set the scene. You have to show what the scenario, what's the problem that's being presented. And I would like you to refer to at least one of the class readings in your presentation. You can do it. Turn off the mic, please. Whoever has it on, turn it off. Thank you. You need to refer to at least one of the readings that you've had in the class to date, in your presentation. It can be in either the scene that you're setting, or it can be in an answer, when after you hear everybody else's answers and you're giving what your group thinks is the answer to the question that you pose at the end, because you're gonna pose a question, remember? You can refer to the readings then. So you have a choice of referring to a reading in your answer or in the presentation part. Any questions? Yes, we have a question, well, we have a comment. Okay. To tell her. We were under the impression, and I think you said that, that we were going to get time to discuss the kids, and we have not met as a group. Yeah, I said, to the kids. I, I did say that. So I said, when you come back in from your break, you'll get 10 minutes with your group. 10 minutes is long enough. It's not a long case. 10 minutes to speak with your group. Yeah. Yes, it's an informal presentation. It's, it's like what I modeled for you last week. So you get, but if you want, would you like 15 minutes? Okay, you need 15 minutes. 10 minutes is fine. 10 minutes is fine. You, obviously, you can, you can come in from your break earlier if you want and meet earlier. 
So I was part of Teach for America. Kristen had just completed a master's degree in education. And they both came to the school with great ideas for improving learning. There were middle class white women who had grown up in the suburbs of New York City. And although they were taught in similar areas, they had not had any experience with the more traditional New York City public school. They sought to promote um, student choice and empowerment, but the students did not um, seem to want to that. They saw this as a reason to have to do time. They were in their mid-twenties, had difficulties managing student behavior and maintaining control of their classrooms. And this was made worse because neither had a mentor teacher assigned and they received little support from the administrator. They were also placed on the same corridor with another first year teacher and that also made the problems more difficult as they had nobody else maybe to speak to about the situation. Um, they knew that they could not be authoritarian and didn't support that strategy. So they spent time getting to know the students and they spent time calling the homes of the students, both to make to make both good and bad reports. The responses they received were mixed. Some parents were enthusiastic, eager to help. Other parents did not care, and others seemed bothered by the frequent calls. They were in contact with the families of both Jackie and the teacher, the two girls involved in the fight. Now, Jackie was a bright girl, a good student, always well dressed. Um, with her hair perfectly styled, she was always in fashion, high heels, long pink, and fingernails. She completed all her assignments, received high grades, and was involved in singing and art at the school. She stayed after school for enrichment programs, with, uh, or just help her teachers, Sarah and Kristen. She lived with both parents, had good parental support, and her parents were always in contact with the teachers. Keisha, on the other hand, was also a bright girl, but struggled in her classes. She constantly pulled her own in class and had difficulty working or completing her assignments. She spent most of her time with girls who had similar behavior and difficulties. And these girls caused trouble throughout the school. Um, Keisha and Sarah and Kristen tried to get to know these girls well and, and um, spend time with them. Um, they called her um, when Kristen first called Keisha's grandmother, Keisha's behavior improved drastically um, as Keisha was fearful that the teachers would call home again. But after a while, her misbehavior returned. Kristen continued to call her grandmother. Keisha's grandmother had raised Keisha since she was born, and her mother was not really involved in her life. Her, Mrs. Jefferson suspected that the mother was on drugs. Mrs. Jefferson worked late each evening until around 6.30 and she was not able to monitor Keisha all the time. She was worried about the neighborhood, she knew it wasn't safe and she knew of the temptations that it offered to her granddaughter and other girls. She could enforce consequences at home but chose not to as she felt it was the duty of the school to maintain discipline. Uh, initially, when she received the calls from the teachers, she was, she was very receptive as she saw it as an improvement in um, the school system. She was disappointed about teachers' behavior and promised the teachers that she would try to help teachers to behave better. After a while, she felt that the teachers were calling for too many things and every little thing, and that the teachers therefore were not, were not fulfilling their responsibilities to control the students. Okay. Um, Mrs. Jameson, evening everybody. Mrs. Jameson said that she was at work and couldn't be bothered all the time um, for all the things that she did wrong. And the, the teacher, Kristen, went on to tell her about the brutal fight. Her grandmother's response was, did she win? Um, <laughs> and went on to say, because if she didn't, she knows better than to come home. Um, <laughs> Kristen was surprised. Um, Mr. Davidson snapped out to her and said, well, thank you. That's all you got to say. Kind of attitude to come up before. Um, the teacher was confused. Didn't understand the response. She knew that even though you don't want to seem weak in the neighborhood, she thought that home is where you would say violence is not a good response. Um, the other teacher, Sarah, said that it was very frustrating because they felt that they didn't have the parental or the home support to what they were having at school. 
And um, they were worried about the values being taught at home versus the values being taught at school. Mrs. Jameson approached Kristen later on and mentioned that she wanted it to be the last time that she was talking about it, uh, but she did want to clear it up. Um, she, she, Kristen, said, all right then, um, let's talk this through. And uh, Mrs. Jameson was basically telling her that she felt that they needed to close the school if the teachers could not, in fact, control the students. Went on to say that she didn't think that white teachers needed to be teaching in this school in the Bronx and they needed to stick with areas and schools that they were familiar with, namely white suburbia. Um, she said that, that their brand of teaching, learning, discipline was not what the students needed. They need to know how to survive, and that's the only thing that's going to get them out of the game. Um, the quote was, you'd be better off going back and teaching those white kids up in Westchester or wherever it is you're from. Kristen's response as the teacher uh, was one of frustration. She didn't know what to say in response. She didn't know what to do. So now that we've given you that, let's talk a little bit about it. Um, each of us is going to take one of the three questions that we've chosen to discuss. I'm going to take the first one, which basically says, what are the assumptions being made by Sarah and Kristen, two first year teachers, um, and by Mrs. Jameson, the grandmother, and are they being communicated? Yeah. Um, Sarah and Kristen, the teachers, were assuming that all the parents, all the guardians, were interested in what was going on in the student's life and that they wanted to be informed of both good and bad occasions. Um, she felt, they both felt that guardians should or would decry or don't cry the violent acts as a response to any kind of upheaval going on, any kind of interaction and further assumed that the students would respond positively to philosophies that foster student choice and employment. Mrs. Jameson, the grandmother on her own hand, uh, she assumed that the teachers would be able to control student behavior, would be able to handle disciplinary matters on their own without bothering her with the, with the details, and had in fact taken a stand as to not do any disciplinary action because the school needed to improve and they needed to learn how to do it on their own. Um, the students and Mr. Jameson expect that the people have to fight to earn their respect, yes? And so this kind of behavior was non-verbally communicated that that was normal, that was okay. Kristen and Sarah, for their part, were communicating that you should be responding positively by continuing to call continuing to try to build relationship um, by doing things together, having the after-school programs and so on. Okay. All right, so I'm going to take the question of whose responsibility is it to change the problematic behavior of the students in IS-91? And I think that we can all agree that responsibility has many different groups. So, for example, it would be both the teachers, the parents, the community at large, but of course, the leadership. And so we come to reading, we just reviewed <laughs> the report, uh, the idea of leadership and continuity, because absent throughout this case study is any mention of a principal stepping in, a principal engaging the, the teachers, engaging the parents, engaging the students. And obviously, um, and even just the idea that a guard comes a car, a guard comes it comes into the guard is the one who's in charge of the school, bridging the fight. So, mm -hmm. so, so for me, that is probably the mo most, the greatest responsibility like the leadership of the school, and then of course, other components are. Okay, um, the question I'm looking at is, if you're a teacher in a similar setting, how would you resolve the situation? Would you involve the principal or any other school person? If you were a caregiver in a similar situation, how would you respond? I think that if I were a teacher at the school, I'd want to involve the principal and maybe the senior staff in helping to resolve the situation. And through the principal, of course, the board of the school. Um, I would need to voice my concerns, especially about the lack of consequences for actions. 
and then prices could put in place codes of conduct which would need to be enforced. Of course, there would also be need for the school to have contact with the parents and community through an organization, for example, like the PTA, that would suggest a formation of some community support group that the PTA. As a caregiver, I would want the best of my child, so I would sit down and have dialogue with the teacher as to how I could um, I could actually contribute to improving child's behavior rather than attacking and saying the teacher should be the only one to do it. Um, I would rather help the teacher help the teacher to work with the difficulties and maybe together we could look at methods to improve student behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we see what they did. They summarized the case. They gave you some of the key characters. They picked three questions and they referenced the reading. One thing they didn't mention. One thing they didn't mention was the fact, or what well, they may have mentioned, but they didn't go into greater detail, was the sort of cultural differences between the grandmother, the grandmother's response, and the teacher's response. And so that's something that would have to be further mediated. Because the grandmother's initial response of did she win and if she didn't win, she shouldn't come home. That's, I mean, but that, that has to do with the culture of where she lives and what she may feel at that time is important. No, the case doesn't go on to say that that might be the grandmother's initial reaction and that a day later the grandmother has calmed down and there's a, a, a different response. But the reason that they included that in the case, I think, is just to point out that my cultural norm and your cultural norm might be different. The student's cultural norm, the teacher's cultural norm, and this case is very similar to the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys were lucky, because it's very similar to the movie, in a sense, but it also brought in Teach for America, and also the age of the teachers is not that much more, they're not that much older than the students. These are high school students, and these are in their early 20s. That's another issue in terms of respect, right? Which perhaps Mrs. G didn't have, but she was older. She was kind of late 20s. Um, all right, so that's, that's one issue about relationships, leadership, accountability, and home school collaboration connection. Thank you. Next up is Bermuda. I don't know what to do about that. Is there a way? Is it there a way? He's on and on the video. And he's the guy. All right, we're here to hear good evening, everybody. Um, um, we're dealing with a case study titled, What Words Don't Say. Um, basically, we have a few characters, main characters, and Martin, which is a student that is the main character that everybody's focusing on. You have his mother, Laureen, his grandmother. You have a few of his friends, Stephen and Sean. You also have uh, a bit of bullies that are lingering around. Um, called Johnny and Mac, and Jose. So the issue is revolving around, the issue, well, the issues are revolving around the facts um, based on that uh, Martin has been moved from a previous hometown and, and um, class or um, school to a new location and he is having a bit of issues settling into his new school. He's missing his old schoolmates. So sometimes he's going back to his old schoolmate, Sean, who has been known to be a little bit troublesome, which is causing Martin a bit of issues with his, his um, ability to be well-mannered or whatever. Um, and uh, so he's trying to settle into this new school with new friends. Stephen, one of his new friends, gave him a present, a watch, 
and uh, the old um, crew, the, the troublesome crew, Johnny Mac and Jose started bullying on Martin. Martin was disappointed. And so um, the, the mother, his mother, Martin's mother, has been communicating with Mrs. Taylor, the teacher, calling mostly phone calls. I think she did send some letters, right? She went into a meeting, um, maybe a few letters were sent home. Um, so they were discussing uh, a bit of the issues that have been going on and trying to resolve something for little Martin, who um, has been a bit moody um, regarding the whole move and settling into this new school. So. Well, just to add a few things, it wasn't actually a new school. I don't think it says that. It's mainly uh, moving from an old neighborhood to a new neighborhood. And then also, Marie, uh, Martin's mother, hadn't actually met with Mrs. Taylor. They just had spoken over the phone. But, uh, yeah, so. Um, I assumed it was a new school. That's okay. Uh, yeah, and then uh, uh, Marie's mother suggests that she talk to Mrs. Taylor and have a meeting with her, and then that's where the meeting comes in. At the end of the case study, uh, Martin's mother goes in to meet with Mrs. Taylor, and uh, basically they both feel awkward about the situation because uh, it's, it's connected to race and, and uh, things like that. And, and uh, on Martin's mother's part, she didn't feel comfortable going to like the PTA meetings and things like that because she's a young black woman and she didn't feel like the administrators and the teachers who are all white would take her seriously. And uh, so she felt awkward during the speech of Mrs. Taylor. And Mrs. Taylor kind of felt awkward because she realized that she might not have had a complete understanding of what was really going on with her students uh, in terms of some of their interactions and things like that and how they uh, resolve problems. And so that's kind of where we left off with uh, Martin's mother and Mrs. Taylor in this meeting. And uh, based on that, uh, there are two questions that we came up with. Or two questions in the but uh, one question is how can Marie overcome uh, her her feelings, her fears, and anxieties about going to the PTA meetings or even talking to the sailor in person? And uh, Vanessa suggested that one way to do that could be to have uh, Martin's grandmother or the Reed's mother to go with her to talk to Mrs. Taylor so she or to go with her to the PTA meeting so that she might feel more comfortable in that environment, someone there to support her. And uh, the other question that came up was, uh, well, in, in the section on, uh, on Mrs. Taylor, she mentions uh, in talking about Sean, who's the troublemaker, she kind of says he's more of a troublemaker, but she also brings up the concept that there are several uh, young men at the school who, who behave similarly, either they have uh, violent entities and anger issues. So the question came up, uh, what can the school do to address and help kids like Sean? And uh, I guess the answer to that could be to possibly do some of the things like the teachers that you mentioned in the last case study are doing, have them actually go and, and visit the families of these kids or you know try and get to know the parents and just the environment these kids are coming from. They can better understand how to relate to them. And it doesn't really seem uh, in the case study that the school is actually doing anything to address the issues of these kids. One of the, uh, what, I'm sorry. Yeah. One of the, um, Readings that we referenced 
for the case study was transforming schools into powerful communities. Um, and basically, we addressed the situation um, where it doesn't really seem like Martin, where, where are Martin's extracurricular activities? What is he being given to focus on to, um, to build his intellectual curiosity, his mind, um, and basically immerse himself into developing habits that give him hope, that sustain him through his difficult challenges. Um, so that was like a question, but that was a, another question, like what could the school do to um, better the environment? Um, so basically provide some kind of, you know, extracurricular, more wholesome, um, more wholesome tactics to provide the students with other opportunities to find like-minded students to engage with and uh, enjoy the whole learning um, experience. So that's what we came up with. Um, I don't know if you want us to go through all of the questions one by one, but I think we pretty much covered a lot of the questions. Yeah, no, that's fine. I asked you just to pick as you did a couple questions that are uh, that speak to the case. So you did you did find the guide and you referenced the reading, so that was good. I, I chose that case because I also wanted to raise the issue of bullying, which is something that all teachers have to deal with at one point or another, and which teachers are not necessarily trained to deal with. We're not all mediators, we're not all diplomats, we're not all conflict resolution specialists. So what can you do? There are a lot of resources online about bullying. Um, for example, there's this one from UNESCO, which basically references additional material and talks about really the importance of opening lines of communication with your students as a strategy, um, supporting students who are interested, who, who are using conflict mediation strategies just normally, who instead of resorting to bullying or teasing or fighting, will try and talk out, talk it out. And supporting them and making an example of them, encouraging that kind of skill set even within your classroom. The extracurricular activities are also important. The importance of teaching to to teaching tolerance, that you don't bully people because of the differences, how they might look differently or act differently from you, and why it's important in life that you treat others with respect, and so that you can gain respect from them as well. So I, I chose that to bring up that issue, because bullying and security of students is becoming a bigger and bigger issue, and now you have the added challenge for some students of cyberbullying, mm -hmm. right? Which, in some cases, have, have been linked to school su suicides, right? Not in, I don't, I'm not talking about in Jamaica, I'm talking about globally, right? Cyberbullying on the computer, right? All right, so next up would be Dominica. Thank you. Yes. Our case survey is a fusion between Tali Eastern, a G student, and Ibn Al-Qasim, a teacher at the center. The, the name of the center is Manzine Family Center. It's run by Manzine Community Center. The, the, the director of the center is Maya Simpson. They have two teaching staff. Lina Parson, which is, she is the adult education teacher, and Nori Tinsley is a childhood education teacher. The program runs for four days per week, and they have eight students in the adult education, ten students in the childhood education. They have four programs at the center adult education class, early childhood program for preschooler, parent child activity time, parenting education workshop. Oh, um, the conflict. Um, we have um, Noreen, Noreen, early childhood education teacher. Now, we, first we meet Carly, so let's meet our first character, Carly Easton. She is a young single mother 
who um, had her, her child at the age of 14, and she lived with an uh, abuser. So she has um, psychological problems due to domestic violence. Now she goes with her daughter, Judy, to the center. Um, she expresses herself in that um, she likes going there, things are getting better for her. She's meeting other single parents who are um, taking care of their kids. And um, she likes Lena because Lena speaks to her. They talk about um, anything and everything. The conflict now is with Noreen, who is the childhood um, education teacher. She, um, she noticed that Judy, um, Carly's daughter, has a speech impediment. And um, without consulting Carly, she goes and she makes um, all the arrangements for her to get help. And then she meets with Carly and tells her um, about her action. Uh, and then she makes all the arrangements one day and they will share the load and she'll carry her one day and she'll carry her the next day. Um, what happened um, in the Carly did not hold on her part of the uh, bargain. Um, she will send Juni to the program so that Noreen will take her for her um, speech impediment, um, whatever, workshop, and stay home. And it came to a point where Noreen was so mad that she um, came to school, called Kali, and threatened to call the um, DSS on her. I think that is the um, some form of uh, social services for her. And um, yes, so Lena is there watching, and um, she has threatened Kali, and now she is waiting for Kali to call her back immediately so that they can resolve that. Lena, on the other hand, although she's very friendly, stays in the background a bit. She, is, she, um, she offers good advice, she's supportive to Nori. When she takes the children to do anything, she will support, keep the, the, the place going. Maya says, she, um, her problem is that, although she's supposed to be in charge, she, um, she says she gives them and um, she's aware of most of the problems in that um, the teachers do not understand the parents and there is conflict there also. But she does absolutely nothing about it. So the question is asking us, if in that situation, how are we going to mend fences so that Kali will get um, what she needs, that is to come to the learning center and educate herself, but also make, I see about Juni and make sure she gets her um, treatment for her speech and credit. Are you picking up? Yes. Anyone? Yeah. 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 Um, yes, and the reading that I got, we got from it, was the pedagogy of the oppressed. In that, um, Noreen is well meaning, she's direct, she's professional, but she doesn't realize you cannot just organize people's lives just because you, you're in a position of power to do so. I think Kali is resentful because she was not really, it was not collaborative effort. And also, Noreen doesn't seem to want to understand her limits. That maybe if she spoke to Lena, who understands Kali a little better, goes to Myra and explains the situation that together, as um, the, the pedagogy, they call it our taxes, where there is reflection, where there is um, critical dialogue before action. And that is what did not happen. So, yes. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, I, that's very good. I, I like the use of the prayer in reading for that. I mean, part of the issue is that she seemed, she's very well-meaning, but she did not involve the parent as a partner. She didn't create a partnership. She just took control and did what she thought needed to be done, created a system, but didn't have the parents buy it, and that's now backfiring. So the lesson, the takeaway from that is, you want the parents to be involved, but you have to get their buy-in. You can't be dictatorial. It has to be participatory. And I also chose that case because it deals with an, an after-school program, so not the typical standard in you know classroom scenario, because not all teachers teach in that scenario. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes people teach in after-school settings or auxiliary type settings as opposed to a full-scale school. But still, there are communication issues. Um, the teacher did well to notice that the child had a speech impediment. But some teachers might have noticed it but not done anything about it or not sought to bring it to the attention of the mother and try and get resources mobilized to assist the child. So that was, that was good on the teacher's part. Um, because the sooner you address a speech impediment, that's something that can affect the child's self-esteem as well as her, her ability to speak confidently or for teachers or people to understand what she's saying, right? So do you have anything else you'd like to add to that case? I, didn't, I don't know if I cut you off, Dominico. Oh, it's okay, we rest. We rest, <laughs> okay, all right. So who would go next? You guys want to go? You want to go? You want to go? Yeah, all of you, all of you. Um, oh, so, so, and all of you guys can sit. One of you sit, one set of you sit. You present the case and do your question, and then you can add anything. <laughs> you go. <laughs> okay, Nina, eat some for me, yeah? <laughs> no, no, no,
already prepared for these students. They put the, the normal curriculum and just drive these students into that same banking concept where you just deposit and the students will be filled and then they go in and be assessed. Now that's how I saw that bit of it. Now, Courtney will continue. Okay. <laughs> Good going. Thank you. Um, so, um, as Ben had already given the overview of what the essence of the whole case was about, um, it was around taking a test, and and and, and there are several um, what we would call differences of opinion as to whether or not the test should be administered or whether it should not be administered. Certainly, there were contentions coming in from the teaching staff um, themselves, and there were also concerns coming from the parents and other persons within the, um, the community, as it were. Um, they, 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 there are several characters that were mentioned. Uh, we just look on the, the fact that they, because of the situation that arises out of the, the whole administering of this particular test and what it does, um, you find out that a lot of parents were having different murmurings and teachers and so on. So there was a meeting schedule so that the various issues could have been discussed. Um, and out of that meeting, several things came forth. Um, we see here one person, um, a particular businessman, um, a James Durbin, or Durin. Um, his contention as a business employer was that a lot of the students coming out of the school system was pretty much being pushed through the system as it is like a factory, as was mentioned in our earlier, um, one of those things that we saw in discussions in class. And so he believes that um, the school should actually be giving the students some ability to come up with reading, the basic reading, writing, and arithmetic skills, which he found that a lot of his HR representatives had a difficulty when they interviewed students coming for jobs that they weren't able to produce these basic skills. Um, we see here also um, a main person as well, um, and she's an activist, Arosa Gemenes. Rosa, right. Um, she was an activist, and she um, brought up a very important point, because one of the issues that they felt that the test was used as a means of exempting persons from, you know, being a part of the society. And if we remember in one of our readings, we talk about um, the whole idea of meritocracy. And it was just based along that by pushing persons that were seeming to be better off in, in certain respect and giving them uh, better words. We also referenced um, the whole idea of, uh, well, sorry, before I go there, our contention was that the schools was basically not equitable. So you had different, um, pretty much like in most of our schools out here, where you find out that one set of school had better facilities than others. And so her contention was, how can we be administering a standard test when all the facilities are not standardized with running water in labs, equal equipment, and so on, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Uh, we saw basically in general that the, the entire case spoke to a, a lot of issues. And I was looking on the character, the main character, Maria herself. And one of the references that we would look on is becoming a reflective teacher, um, because certainly she had a lot of contentions. She herself wanted to, you know, didn't like the idea of how the test was administered, but based on the fact that it was a, um, a top-down approach coming from the state, she was almost forced to conform, but she wanted to break out and become a more reflective teacher, having a more student-centered approach rather than having um, coming from the state. I don't know if they want to. Yeah. Um, what we, we see all of those people coming out, but the leader, the principal, he was notably very absent. So in that, you know, we, we were looking at the whole leader, leadership. But I mean, the principal did not come down on 
one side or the other about the M class test. It was uh, like the other teachers in the internal college for the PTA meeting. The principal was the leader, he was totally absent. So the school was like a brotherless. Yeah, a lot of the questions to answer here. What are the pros? Just one of the questions. Ten questions. All right, as long as it's not the same question. Oh, okay. Um, what are the pros and cons of the math test test? Uh, it's called the M pass. That's a real test. M pass, right? M pass test. According to all of the people, Marie has talked to recently because she spoke to a parent who was also very much confused with how this um, was being a freshman student. Um, a pro I see here is where, you know, as Courtney mentioned, where you're assessing the students to see their stance and understanding the different subject areas and also how they would go into the work area and the, as they can resource that business plan, how you Speaking about students and their 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 ability to their their language ability, their math ability, arithmetic, etc. Our con is children losing interest and their enthusiasm for subject because the practice has now become bland and very monotonous. Just for the one specific assessment, which should not be the benchmark of students' set, um, success in the future. Another con is students becoming rude or impolite to teachers because they do not understand the basis of this assessment. And they have lost all the light in the subject because it's overly repetitive. And students do not get an opportunity to explore or any discovery learning in that bit while they learn. So they no longer have confidence in such a teacher anymore and they have lost their life for all subjects. So it may lead students to a case of confusion and want to feel. Okay. All right. Thank you, three. The trio. Thank you. Um, so this case I chose because many of it, many of our systems have. I'm going to let you guys speak. I'm just going to do this as a little commercial in between. Um, because many of our systems are based on testing. They're very test based. So in this case, this is a real test. It is a series of tests, rather, in the state of Massachusetts. But the difference between these tests in Massachusetts and the ones that we take at least in our case in Jamaica in terms of the GSAT, is that the GSAT determines the student's placement, what high school they will go to. The MPAS is just one of multiple forms of assessments that are used now to give um, in grades 10, 11, and 12 for them to be able to get a high school diploma, but it is not the only component. That's the difference. So it's high stakes, but it's not as high stakes as other tests, which is why the teacher is having this is able to be having this dilemma because if it was a this a mandatory test like in Jamaica, there's no dilemma about the GSAT. You have to take the GSAT, or you're not going, you're not staying in the public system. Um, okay, moving on to you. You're going to ask a different question and or add anything that this trio may have missed in the presentation. Well, um, and pick a reading. You have to come and stand up so they can see you, please. Okay. Yes, I don't even know. My issue. Not what you want. Miss, one of the, the things that I was looking at. No, no, no. Lovely, lovely. One of the things that I was looking at is the leveling of the thing. Because. Which you made, which you pointed out. Right. No, the card of the nation, but in past, right, and, and I heard it, all schools are not equal and they're looking at standardized testing. So, even in the standardized, standardized testing, there will be some level of inequity. But at the same time, too, when I, yes, we hear a reflective teacher, we hear open-mindedness and um, wholeheartedness and all the different elements of a reflective teacher, but at the same time, I still didn't see Maria taking action. Marie, Marie, taking action. She's reflecting, she's, no. But if the case is well, to, to speak with the principal, right. may be a form of action. Right. And it ends with her going into the door, into the office of the principal, but you don't know uh, what you don't know what happens. Right. She's just, she's just, in the from, the, from the perspective of reflective teachers, being reflective teachers, they do not take things coming from, 
has it comes without you know having their own values coming to bear on what they're practicing. Right. Especially trying to weigh you know what her parents are saying, or the students are feeling, and trying to bridge the gap to satisfy her different collectively. Well, at least she didn't get up and go. And and then she also yeah. I think she, 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 went. she also mentioned the fact that after the lunch meeting her friend that she would try to orchestrate mm -hmm. some way of getting the parents to join yes. and the school that is to join in with this protest yes. as well. Again, yes. the so yes. we see where our minds it is, it's just that it wasn't she, she, she was that probably I don't have the literature to back it. Alright, so um Peter Wright that was talking. So we're not looking at Del Pita, we're not going to do But my issue still is, I think there's some level of fear because on yes, her part, meaning that she will be assessed. So the assessment will not be just for the students alone, but she will also be assessed right. as a teacher. Right. And then the school school also, that, that's an important yes, that's part. An important that's part. another difference between their testing yeah. system and ours, and our teachers are not assessed. Oh. Well, and now it's changing. It's changing. Yes. Yeah. And I think one of one of the one one of the persons at the meeting said, "But standardized testing will be good for us. It may be the best of So standardized testing will be good for us because it can actually set the standard for who he's employing. Yeah. Who's from, yeah. You know, that's, that's the argument for it. Yeah. One of you guys mentioned it. Right. right, but I think there is fear all along. She being a new teacher and too, and she's going to be assessed based on this. And the real person in her, she wants to advocate for her students. Mm -hmm. Because when she spoke with the parents of Betty Williams yes. and, and mm -hmm. other, in the, others in the meeting, she's getting a feeling from most of the parents that the children are reacting, they are actually really? traumatized. Mm -hmm. Because one, pay, one child who really loves the teacher, when she looks at it, all the, what they call it now? The drill. She does not question her the teacher was my best teacher in the whole wide world. I know she's right. So also the teacher's social capital and profile is So yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. it was one of the readings that went against about you know the mind body. Body care. Body politics. How did the students perceive the teacher? That's a good. That's a good observation. Granted, right? In, in in Jamaica or maybe it's on the other islands too. You know, you don't have a choice. We have to do the GSAT. Whether you yeah. want to teach it, whether you want the student to take it or not, but you do have a choice to try and make how you deliver the lessons be as innovative, as as interesting to you and to the students. So it doesn't have to be drill memorized and uh, memorization, drilling and so on. There's an element of drilling, but drilling can be done. In the format of a game show, for example, not on a computer necessarily, but yes, on a computer too. And there's a lot of new software for that. But to just change, you know, you, you can have a squeaky toy and you have to hit the squeaky toy and you have teams and you have to answer the question. And that's another way of reviewing for anything, not just the GSAT, right? Um, you had another point? Yes, Mr. was just saying that they were, they were a bit frustrated because the principal was really getting much in. They were getting much feedback from the principal as to what they should do. Right. Yeah, which goes back to the importance of leadership and being a visible principal. Because if you don't see the principal, then you start to wonder who's driving this car or, or whatever, conducting the boat or whatever the phrase is. All right, well, you all went through all the case studies a lot faster than I had anticipated, but that's okay. Because for next week, instead of continuing with the case study since we're finished, what we'll do is your classroom comparison papers are due. Remember that? Yes. Your classroom comparison papers are due. I've been getting emails from individual students, and although the, the assignment sheet had asked you to compare a class in a school where you're teaching now, or one another, perhaps another tertiary class that you're in that you can visit, or a friend's class if you have a friend who's a, a teacher, not the class you're teaching against a class that you were in as a child, some of you have emailed me and said, you find it hard to do the part about the one where you were a child because you don't remember, and so on. So, I'm telling you now, and I will email again. I'm interested in two classrooms being compared. 
It cannot be a classroom that you are teaching in. It cannot be this classroom. It has to be, it can be two tertiary classrooms that you are currently in now in this program, not this one. It can be a high school classroom that your friend is teaching in, but not your own. If you can feel comfortable comparing it to a classroom that you were in as a child, you feel you can access those memories and use the readings and tools of comparison. If you can do that, then please do it. If you're more comfortable doing two current ones, you can do that. My concern is that you have two classrooms to compare. And that it not be one that you teach in or that I'm teaching. Okay? And that you reference the readings. Please reference the readings. Please do not simply mention the readings. There's a difference between mentioning it and referencing it. Referencing it means that you are using the reading to make a specific point. Mentioning it means you just in passing say, as Delpit said in whatever the title of the article is, um, year. That is not using the reading to back up your point. You need to paraphrase Delpit or quote her directly to support whatever point you're making. So, if I am talking about a teaching strategy that I'm observing in a class, and I've observed, so let's say I go to watch Thalia teach. I'm just using it there as an example. And Thalia, Thalia is teaching her IT class, and I see that she has included, I see in her delivery, that she has included both a tactile activity, as well as a verbal activity, as well as a numerical activity. I can say that Thalia is applying, seems to be applying elements of multiple intelligences. Then I would explain what the theory of multiple intelligences is, as to why I'm saying Thalia is doing that, what the intelligences are, and which ones Thalia is, is showing. It isn't good enough for me to simply say Thalia is applying the, the theory of multiple intelligences, because you cannot assume that I know what it is. I need to know that you understand what it is, so you are going to explain it. If you choose to quote Howard Gardner directly, you can do that, but then you have to use quotation marks and put a page number. You cannot just quote the people and you don't put the page number. Right? Which 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 most of you do. Which when the pre in the first paper, most of you did that. There's only a handful of you that used actual quotation marks and gave me an actual page number. Um, all right. Um, yes, as it relates to, to the quotation with the page number, I, I'm not sure if I'm the only one that has that problem, but some of the cases that we have here, those who actually have um, oh, really? page online? numbers, yeah. they're online, a lot of them. So, oh, the online don't have, but now have page numbers on my present. Yeah, but it won't be the same. So that's where I had a I would make, I can make a quotation or a question before I can't say exactly what page. Oh, well, all right. If that's the case, then online. I mean, the copies that I have have page numbers, but maybe your copies, since they're accessed from potentially different sites, don't have. But then just put NP, meaning no page, no page number. Okay, all right. In that case. Um, I didn't know that that was the case because I've never, I've never had that. Or some of them where I see on some, some website here, like they have another one that doesn't. Have. No, but it doesn't. It doesn't. So, so you should be using the references that I gave you. Some of you use references from, I don't know, I don't know where, from other books, from other courses, books not related to this course at all, or readings not related to this course at all. That's great that you're using references, but the assignment sheets say use the readings from this course. <laughs> so if you want to add additional readings, that's up to you, but I need to see some from this course. And I, and I would prefer to see more than one. So in this case, I have listed three specific ones. So please turn in a paper that references each of the three readings. If you don't find anything to reference from the reading, then simply say, unfortunately, or interestingly, when I observed junior high school class 2A, I did not notice 
any evidence of the type of teaching described in critical pedagogy and the critic whatever. I did not see evidence of A, B, C, D, and then you have showing me. Why do you think I'm asking you to show evidence from the readings? Because I'm checking to see that you have at least cursorily read the reading. Because I can't tell if you've read it in great depth, especially with this distance thing. You all in these other countries and even in front of me can be sitting on computers surfing the net while I'm teaching the entire time. I have no idea what's going on in St. Lucia and Dominica and so what you're looking at. This is one of the challenges of teaching with technology. Even sitting in front of me here, they can be on um, e-magazine or whatever, or Facebook, right? So the assignments are a way for me. Some of you are more comfortable speaking in class. And when you speak in class, you show me that you have done some reading. Some of you. Some of you are not so comfortable speaking in class. And for some of you, because of this distance thing, it's even harder for me to get to speak, you to speak in class. So I don't have the, that reference that you have read the reading. Therefore, the assignments and the test are a way for me to assess that you have at least read some of the readings for the class and that when you leave this place and this class, you will take away something. Hopefully, the key points that I will I will go over next week when I do the test review, I will tell you the topics that are going to be on the test. It does not, let me rephrase that. The topics that might be on the test. It does not mean, it does not mean that every single thing I list will appear on the test. But there is an element of choice in the test. As I've told you before, the first part is there is no element of choice in the first part. There are short answer questions worth five points each. The second part is a long answer question and you get to choose probably one of three. In that one, in each question, you have to reference a reading. It's deliberately written that way because it's not a multiple choice test and it's not a math test where I can be grading correct answers. So therefore I need to see evidence of the reading. Obviously I don't need page numbers on the test. Right. <laughs> So I need to know that you have a sense of what engaged pedagogy is, that you have a sense of what the theory of multiple intelligence is, that you have a sense of what the banking concept of education is, that you have a sense of the three theories of education, the three sociological theories. You can understand what functionalism is, you understand what interactionism is, you understand what conflict theory is. If somebody asked you to tell them in a nutshell what they were, you don't need to know the intricate details, we just need to be able to convey and understand it. And I'll go over more of that next week. But for the per hold on a second, um, Ash. For the purposes of this paper, what I've just said is I want, I'm repeating it, two classrooms compare. One can be one that you were in as a child if you're comfortable doing that. Or it can be two classrooms at any levels that you want. It is easier to compare classrooms currently at the same level. So it would be easier to compare two tertiary level classrooms. But that's up to that's up to you. I just want two classrooms. Not the one I'm teaching and not one that you're teaching. If that may be the case. I want the readings referenced and I will ask some of you to share some of the findings next week. So next week we will be doing a little bit of that sharing. I will go over the test topics with you and do a brief review. And I will also talk to you a little bit about Bloom's taxonomy, which I realize I skipped over. Do you all know what Bloom's taxonomy is? If you've heard of it, raise your hand. So not that many of you, not that many of you. So I might send you a short reading on that, but I'll just go over it because Bloom's taxonomy has to, I think is quite strongly related to reflective teaching and teaching for understanding. So I'll just bring that in. I won't put it on the exam, but I'll still bring it in. Um, next week. And then I'll also share with you a child-friendly schools framework. So when you bring your classroom connections papers in, I'll talk to you about the child-friendly schools framework and then you can think amongst yourselves, was my school, was the schools that I watched, does that look like it's really child-friendly or not? Just for the purposes of the discussion and because it's an international framework that's used in school reform movements around the world both from the standpoint of how the school is built, how the classrooms are laid out, to how the, what kind of teaching takes place. 
Okay, so that's an idea of what we'll do next week. Questions, Ashley and Jason. We had both had uh, regarding the exam, you said that you want us to reference uh, in part. Do, does that mean that we have access to our notes? No. Sorry, let's be clear. It's not an open book test. What you know is what you know going into the exam. So if I ask you to explain engaged pedagogy, you need to tell me what it is. This is a theory proposed by Bell Hooks. It has to do with self-actualization, which means being better able to understand oneself as a teacher and as a person and as a continual learner. A little bit more than that and you'd be done. Also, I'm, a little, I'm a little concerned about spelling. Um, no. <laughs> I've been doing very much writing by hand. Right. My spelling is not great. So I was just a little concerned about my spelling because I usually type out everything. Are you going to be really hard like on the spelling and everything? Yeah. Um, That's a good question. Is that a yes? I'm thinking. I'm just don't. 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 It's just everything out. So how, how it works in the other countries is that I have to send the exam to the central office and they send it to you all. If you if you want to do a typing of you no, you can't do that because you could be looking at all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> just no, can I as long as I can tell what the bar is, I'm more interested in, in the content. Jason? Did you have a question? Did the English of the case studies? Yes. Did I miss a case study, St. Lucia? Oh my god, we didn't get to St. Lucia. Oh, good, so you're up next week. You're up next week, St. Lucia. Are you all going to sit there quietly? Don't it. And let me just think. You see, you see what I'm telling you about Jason? You see about Jason? Jason catches every misstep that I make. You see it? I can always count on Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not lying to you. Thank you, Jason. So, St. Lucia, you will be up first next week. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, have a good night, everybody. I'm telling you, Jason is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>